Good morning. I'm Mark Teglar, and I'll be reading the scripture this morning. It comes to us from 1 Samuel 23, and I would encourage you to read along in your bulletin or in your Bible. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give you the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah and besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about six hundred, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. The Neziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh, on the hill of Hashilah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it has told me that he is very cunning. See, therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go out with you, and if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judea, or Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the Araba, in the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David, his men, on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of Engedi. Within the last week or so, Mrs. Middleton's class, shout out to Andrina and Bree, I think of that same teacher. And we were doing assignments on determining Irony in a text, 
situational dramatic irony, and, and I'm trying to help my daughter, and I'm not quite understanding the assignment, and my daughter goes, it's easy, Dad. C. I'm like, what's C? Statement, S. Examples or evidence, E, and then explanation, S-E-E. Oh, okay. So I'm supposed to understand what irony is. I'm supposed to see an example in the text, and then I'm supposed to explain it as part of the assignment. And I was struck by that assignment as we were working on that, and I'm, I'm one of those nerdy dads that loves English language arts. But I realized that the Bible sometimes could use a little bit of help with us understanding it with that kind of a method, especially in this text. Besides all those horrific Old Testament names and places that Mark just had to read, there's a lot of verses, a lot going on, another ongoing chase of David by Saul. But I want to tell you that the major thrust of this text, and noted by the church for a long time, is the providence of God. A providence is a big word, and it's a big and important doctrine. It doesn't need to be complex. The first seven words, or first seven letters of the word providence is provide. So you can be seven years old and know that providence means that God is the one who provides. The doctrine of providence is significant in understanding the world in which we live and the situations that we face. In fact, I'll even just tell you right now, the Bible, the Bible passages love to do this. The thrust of this passage is in verse 14. It, the Bible loves to do that. It loves to start with a story, give you the main point, and then end it. It loves to frame things like a picture. In verse 14, in the middle of the search, before Jonathan comes and comforts David and he escapes one more time, the text says at the end of verse 14, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. There's the thrust. This entire text from start to finish shows the providence of God over David and the providence of God in which David is seeking and trusting. And therefore, it has a lot for us to see. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start with a statement. C, S. The S of C. What is the providence of God? Before we look at the text to see some evidence and give some explanation. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word, which we come to because we need so dearly. Father, we need your word like we need oxygen. We need your truth. We need your perspective. We need your counsel and wisdom. We need your rebuke and correction. So help us to receive from your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with statement. The biblical doctrine of providence offers us a truth about the world and a tool for life. Both of those are true. Like What we're going to talk about as I'm drawing from Scripture about what is the providence of God, it's going to tell you how the world works. Like This is how he designed the world. This is how God runs the world. But it also becomes a useful tool for all the circumstances that you and I my face. Here's a starting premise from Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You hear that? No, no, those are the dual agency, right? You and I have our plans. We use our reason, our logic. We determine what we're going to do. We make plans, and it's all good and all true, but we make our plans, but the Lord establishes our steps. The doctrine of providence, as Vera rightly said to our kids, is drawn from the doctrine of creation, that the God who created all things is also the God who sustains all things. The same power, the same creativity. I mean, think of God's power to create all of what we see out of nothing. Think of his imagination Talk about creative. Think of the most beautiful places you've seen in the world or pictures you've seen, maybe even of outer space. Think of your favorite place to hike or, or ledge to stand and look over, over a valley of pine trees or rocks or mountains or a river or waterfall. Think of all God's creativity in the human body. The eye alone is a mystery. 
The brain and all the function, think of all of that creativity and all of that power. The same force of creativity, intentionality, and power that was involved in the making of all things is ongoing and involved in the sustaining of all things. Both the creating and the sustaining are divine works, neither less great and glorious than the other. And now we're starting to see how the, how the word works, not just how it began. And often that's where we kind of, kind, of, kind of land ourselves. We often debate the origin of all things. And understandably, that's, that's a debate. That's worth discussing. There's a mystery, but there's an importance to how it all started. But how it's all maintained is of the same God and of the same power and of the same intentionality and control. I really am blessed by the Heidelberg Catechism I found it helpful for me personally, and I find it helpful for us as a church. And the doctrine of providence was so important that of all the catechism questions, remember a catechism is a learning tool of giving people biblical scaffolding to know what is true about God and us from his word and to remember it in ways. So it's always a question and an answer. Questions 27 and 28 hit right on this doctrine. Here's how the Heidelberg Catechism answers the question, what do you understand by the providence of God? And think about our brothers and sisters through wars and famines and sickness and funerals and all those things, knowing and memorizing these words as ministry aids. Here's the answer the Heidelberg Catechism gives. What is the providence of God? God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power. I love that ever-present It's not just to kick things off and then, hey, I'm over here in a lounge chair. No, it's ever-present power. Whereby, as with his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them. That, and listen to the examples of his governance. Leaf and blade, that's where it starts. He governs every little leaf. Rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Boy, that's dense and beautiful. And it's trying to hold, you ever carried too much in your arms and every time you adjust your arm, something else falls out. It's trying to hold all the truths of God's sovereignty and power and intentionality along with his mercy and his compassion and his paternal care, all in one. It's almost like you're summarizing every book of the Bible. This is who God is and how he works. I love that it adds in leaf and blade but it adds in positives and negatives. Rain and drought. Fruitful years and barren years. Health and sickness. Riches and poverty. They're all guided by his fatherly hand, not by chance. Now you'll see that word that gets tossed around in common lingo that Christians for millennia. It was Augustine who would rebuke people in his perish for using the word luck or fortune. It's like, no, no, no. Do not think that's how the world works. No stargazing, no fate, no fortune, no chance, no luck. What looks like luck or fortune is ordered and purposeful by the providence of God. It's almost like the Heidelberg Catechism is trying to open up the hood of our world and say, this is, this is the engine. There's, here's God who's creator and sustainer. He is super powerful. There isn't anything that's outside of him making it so. Remember, remember Proverbs 16, 9, we make our plans, but the Lord establishes our steps. Like he controls all things. He's that big, but he's also that loving and gracious and intentional and purposeful. Like, now put the hood down and drive in that reality. That's why it's not just a, 
truth about how the world works. It's a tool for how we should live our lives. It's how God is at work around us, for us, as our Father. Before first service, little kid coming down, clearly hungry and grouchy, screaming. Normally, I greet this kid, and I'm like, what's up, man? Like, ah, growls at me until a parent came, and boom, the moment that parent picked up that little kid, ah, peace. There's that image at the end of Heidelberg Catechism 27. All things come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. You literally, brothers and sisters, children of God, listen to this. You literally are being held by your heavenly father. Who knows the hairs on your head, easier to count on some of us than others. Who literally is sovereign over every leaf on every tree in your yard. Certainly then he is with you when there is beautiful amounts of rain or when you are in drought. Seriously, he is with you when your body could not be healthier than, and when you are dealing with horrific sickness. He is with you in every moment. That is the hood you're supposed to lift up and see that scripture says, here's how the world is working. That is your God. That's why question 28 in the Heidelberg Catechism answers this. What does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? Here, here's the catechism answer that our brothers and sisters have memorized for centuries. We can be patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity. I love how both of those are there. If you are just, if you're like, I feel so blessed right now, then guess what? You should totally be in a posture of thankfulness because you know that God establishes all things. And if you are in absolute adversity right now, you literally are worried about your finances for next month, or you're going through some marriage crises that feel so big, uh, stuff we don't talk about, we don't feel like we can share in church, like you're like, what is even happening here? You are patient in adversity because the father, like that little child in the hall today, is holding you in his arms, and there is nothing that will happen to you that doesn't have his direct, purposeful intentionality from start to finish. And that sounds easy to believe when things are going well. That is necessary to believe when things are going poorly. And we can challenge that all we want or not feel like that's the case, but the Bible would say that is how the world works. And you believe that God created all things? Well done. Do you believe he sustains all things? Live like it. Catechism 27 or 28 ends the, the answer to what's the benefit of this for us. We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father. Love that. Hard to believe sometimes. With a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father. Remember that image of that child being held by a parent? That no creature shall separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. You might not feel right now, here's the thing, you might not feel like you're being held by the Father, and probably only my son could pick me up in this room today, but the reality is, according to God's word, you are literally in the Father's hand. Who is the Father? He is the most sovereign, powerful being that is. There is nothing that can in any way thwart his perfect intentions for you. He is also not just powerful, he is super intentional and he loves you sacrificially. Again, it's not just something I know about the world, like I know about a car engine or a computer. It's something I'm living out. You take your steps knowing that your plans are established by the Lord, Proverbs 16, 9. And you walk with patience in adversity. 
and with thankfulness in prosperity because you know who is God and Father in your life. There's the doctrine of providence. There's that statement, getting back to Mrs. Middleton in sixth grade English. What are we talking about when we say the providence of God? Let's define it. That's what it is. I love how John Calvin describes some of this in his institutes. He says, God always has the best reason for his plan. Again, hard for us to trust based on circumstances. We're supposed to trust this based on Christ and his character. God always has the best reason for his plan, either to instruct his own people in patience or to correct their wicked affections or to tame their lust or to subjugate them to self-denial or to arouse them from sluggishness. Again, to bring low the proud, to shatter the cunning of the impious, to overthrow their devices. Yet however, hear this, yet however hidden and fugitive from our point of view, the causes may be. We always want to go to the cause. Like why? Why? What's the reason? The Bible kind of slaps our wrist on that. Whatever the causes may be, we must hold that they are surely laid up with him. Calvin's saying it old school way. We might say this, whatever the reason behind what's going on in prosperity or adversity, we must believe that God is good and he's intentional. And we must believe that and trust that. It's not easy to do. Providence, the providence of God, therefore, is a confession of faith. It ministers to us in our circumstances. What are you struggling with now, brothers and sisters? Your health? Are there questions? Are there tests? Waiting results? Are there concerns about your body? Do you trust the fatherly hand of God who holds you and establishes your steps? How about your finances or your job? And there's questions about work. Or how I'm going to make ends meet. Like you're, you're trying to be patient in adversity, but man, circumstances are just kind of imposing them on you. Do you trust the fatherly hand of God who holds you? What about your relationships? What about your children and grandchildren? What about your past or things about your future? God is so much bigger than that. God's providence isn't just a truth about the world it's a tool for our lives. We trust in God's absolute power and his perfect love, and we understand that God's mystery means we may never know exactly how or when or why, but we know who. Well, we did the statement. Bree, Andrina, Ruthie, you can tell Mrs. Middleton that. But we haven't done the evidence and explanation from the text. And when we look at 1 Samuel 23, the providence of God is clearly displayed in the ways God deals with David. Look with me at verse 1. He, the story starts, and again, this compassionate David, right? He's being chased by the king of Israel, who literally is willing to kill his own son to get to David. And he hears about the Philistines attacking a border town and robbing the threshing floors. You know what that means? That means that they have no food for the year. Like, it's not like the store's empty and they'll get more of a, another shipment on Wednesday. It means that the harvest is being stolen and they're losing their food. Now, David would have every reason to say, oh, God, I got enough on my plate right now. My suffering is on full. I can't carry any more suffering. But he looks to their need. And then look what he does in verse 2. He inquires of the Lord. But he wants to seek the needs of others. He sees the needs of others even when his own situation is extremely difficult, and he asks the Lord for wisdom and guidance. Brothers and sisters, learn from this based on God's providence. We cannot help every need. There's no way. But we can leave ourselves open to all possibilities. Because you and I are going to be tempted to feel like our own problems are big enough, and we will be tempted to focus on our own problems problems. But when we trust in God's providence, we are less likely to hoard our resources 
so that we can help others. Because you will see the inward bent of sin, which will make you want to use your time and your talent and your treasure for you. And yet even David exemplifies the posture of a Christian who when he is has his own burdens to bear, he's already being chased by one militia or army, now he's going to take on another one? Seriously? As his men will say in a minute, excuse me, captain, can I see you for a minute? This is crazy. But when he trusts the providence of God, he asks how even in his own suffering and own issues, he might serve the Lord and others. Another example is right there in verse 2, and it starts out as David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack? David's life is lived with the full assumption that God is king over every detail. Like, do you and I live that way? If we really understand, we lift up the hood and we see the engine of the world, like God is intentional with everything he does and everything he makes, then think about that for a minute, then you and I should want to be intentional in alignment with God with everything we do. I think that's part of the reason how Paul can say pray without ceasing. Not that we're literally, I can't go to work today, praying, it's biblical. But more like this, I am constantly aligning my will to the will of the Father. Like everything I do is trying to align with his purposeful intentionality for the creation he is sustaining. By seeking the will of the Lord, David reflects a posture of humility and service, not ownership and rights. Such a posture is also in the beneficial position of submitting to the decision of the Lord. Lord, what is your will? And hear this, sometimes God's providence says that the will of the Lord is drought. Sometimes the will of the Lord is adversity. Sometimes the will of the Lord is barren years in your life or the lives of others. But when we trust in God's providence, we learn to seek God's will, to wait for his answer, and to hold things in our lives more loosely. Maybe, maybe that's why, I don't know what the origin of this is, but maybe that's why the common practice in Christian Churches going back for a long time is prayer before every meal, right? As cate catechism would say, thankful in prosperity. Lord, thank you for this food, because we know full well, even if it was the skill of our hands or the, the smarts of our minds or the resources that you, you are the source of all things. And we thank you for that. Our hands are open. Not ownership, not rights, but Humility and service. A third example is in verse 3 through 5. When David's men raise their, their concerns, David again seeks the will of the Lord. It's kind of understanding. I love what David's men say in verse 3. Uh, they go, behold, which rarely do we say that. Behold, there's an oncoming truck. Like, you probably wouldn't say it that way. You'd say, uh, hold on a second. Can I got to tell you something. Excuse me. The men say, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go and against the armies of the Philistines? Like, I go, like, I'm nervous in my own home. How much more if I'm sitting in the eastern edge of Ukraine with bombs dropping down? Is this wise? The men ask, they're, they're, that's sensible. There's logic. There's reason. David hears that. He Here's the concern. He himself could wonder, Lord, is that really wise? So he seeks the Lord again. Notice it says in before, then David inquired of the Lord again. He hears, he listens, he's walking along the intentionality of God in his life. He balances the reality of his, of his circumstances with the truth that nothing is beyond God's power. Lord, maybe that is unwise. Guide us. What should we do? Because God may be caring for us at times with common grace. Somebody says to you, hey, I wouldn't do that. And you respond and listen. That's good advice. 
Thanks for telling me. Now I know. Or he may say, man, that seems crazy, but you know full well that God can do things and ask you to do things that go beyond what might be seen by others. Something beyond what we can see or expect. You see, when we trust in God's providence, we walk with simple steps that recognize and reach for God's fatherly hand. It was 51 days ago, 52, when we got told by the doctor that my wife had ALS. And I literally felt, one way I can describe is I felt like a shop vac was being sucking my guts out on the inside. I just felt hollowed out. And for the first 10, 14 days, I could not sleep. And I am the opposite of a non-sleeper. It would annoy my wife to no end. She would lay, when we first got married, she would lay there forever. And like within two minutes, good night, I'm gone. And I would just, I, I, I sleep through the entire night. I've never had trouble sleeping. I could do that on a floor. I could do that in a car. Uh, I could, it's like a green eggs and ham song or something. But I could, I could sleep anywhere without a problem. And then all of a sudden, I'm waking up at 3.30 in the morning, and I'm panicking, and I cannot sleep. It's like it was in my soul, and it needed to be worked out. And besides all the questions of the chaos of the moment, what was clear for me was the panic I felt for our three kids. That, that instinctive parent role of just, oh, I cannot I cannot protect. I, I felt like it was unfair. And I remember, I, and I knew, I knew the answer. It, it wasn't, I, I didn't, it's like I didn't know the theology answer or the Bible verse. I knew those. It wasn't about my head. It was about my heart. And I just wrestled with not liking. That's the barren years rather than the fruitful or the sickness rather than the health. I wasn't willing to acknowledge that or submit to that or whatever you want to say. And I woke up one of those last nights, 3 3 in the morning, and I rolled around for a while. And I left and I walked downstairs and I went into, into the garage and shut the door so I could speak out loud. And I prayed. And I voiced to God that He is sovereign over all things. At this, I mean, Heidelberg Catechism stuff. Like, I am reading the Catechism, and I'm saying, I need your help to believe this. My soul doesn't want to. I felt that combination of rebuke. I don't, I, I know he's bigger than all these things. I know I'm hardly the first man or father or parent to worry about their kids. But I had to do that in my own soul. I cried out to my Lord. I begged him to help me in my unbelief and my lack of trust and my submission. And I gave it to our king. And I went upstairs and I went right to sleep. And the next night, I went right to sleep again. That doesn't mean I don't wake up at times and have a moment of panic or frustration or disappointment in my lot, or whatever it may be. Absolutely, I'm human. But that pray without ceasing is me feeling that pull and grabbing the anchor. Grab it. Grab it. Every time I feel the, like you're on one of those trains going from various parts of the airport, and as long as you're holding that pole, whatever, you're, like, you're looking out the window, you're not even worried about it, because you're good. If you're not holding that, you're just like jumping the whole time. But you grab that pole, and you're, you're good. Like, you just keep holding that, and I just got to keep holding that pole. And that pole is God's providence. And I went to my garage, and I grabbed that providence, and I will not let go. It doesn't mean I don't feel the pull. Of course I do. Or at times, want to let go and trust in my own power. Of course I do. But I grab that pole, and I hold. Why? Because I know that God's providence is his ever-present power. That he still upholds heaven and earth and all creatures. And who are those creatures? The three that were born in my little house. 
And he governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, health and sickness, riches and poverty, all things come to us, not by chance, but by God's fatherly hand. Beautiful. More than beautiful. That's not a plaque. Don't put that on a plaque and give it to me. Tattoo it to my soul. And so in that garage, I took the tool of God's providence, the only tool I've probably ever used in my garage. I took the tool of God's providence and I applied it to my soul. It's like oxygen for me now. Remember what Calvin said? We don't know the reasons, but God always has the best reason to instruct us, to correct us, to tame us, to subjugate our self-denial, to arouse us from our sluggishness, to bring low the proud. All of those things have worked in me in this moment. Because I'm holding on to God's providence. And so is David. The last example I want to show you as we do this example explanation from Mrs. Middleton's sixth grade class at Roscoe Middle School is Saul. And Saul is a counter to David. Look at verses 6 to 14. Saul foolishly links the will of God to his particular circumstances. He says it specifically in verse 7. He hears where David is in a city with what? With gates and bars, meaning there's not a good access point. And look what he says. God has given him into my hand. No, verse 14 corrected that strongly. In contrast to David, Saul thinks that his circumstances tell him what God is going to do. He links the will of God with what he can see. Don't we all want to do that, though? Don't we all want to limit God to our purview and our perspective and our purposes and even our plans? The actual work of God, however, was not limited by circumstances. There's that verse 14. Saul sought him, but God did not give him into his hands. Circumstances unimportant. The rest of our text confirms God's providential care for David. He even has Jonathan, his brother in the Lord, come and say, Brother, I want to strengthen you, exhort you, encourage you. There is that reflection of God's people, the church, ministering along, both encouraging the thankful in their prosperity, but also supporting those who are trying to be patient in their adversity. Like Saul, brothers and sisters, we are tempted to make decisions based on our circumstances. And when we do, we limit God, we rebuke God, we demand from God. That was me in the garage. I was kind of rebuking him. I didn't like the choice. I had a concern about his parental care for my three kids. Really? What would he have said to me any different than he would say to Job? You care for your kids more than I do? Where were you when they were created in eternity past in my mind? How are you really providing for them in all the ways that you think you can do? You're their protector, really. When we trust in God's providence, we look at every circumstance with the, with the spectacles of providence. Calvin says, our faith ought to penetrate more deeply as it looks at life and circumstances. So what are you facing right now, brothers and sisters? Some of you worried about health? Some of you about work and finances? How about your kids or grandkids? How about your marriage or other relationships in your family or other crises that I'm not even listing? Well, remember this, that you are fully benefited to know and believe and trust in the providence of God so that you can 
in adversity, you can be patient. Because you know, like that little child out in the hallway, you are held in your father's arms. And if you're in prosperity right now, you can be so thankful. Because you know it's not really you. As we sang about not boasting, now we know why. I love Psalm 63, which is, it says in the, in, the, in the script above the text, if you were looking at it in your Bibles, it was written in the wilderness of Judah. Notice the wilderness of Judah is mentioned twice in this text. For Samuel 23, many people believe that Psalm 63 was written by David in this very moment, arguably. Some debate whether it was a couple chapters earlier or this one, but it's right around this time. And David says these words in verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 63, Talking to God, he says, For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. Love that image. Like, there's that parent holding that kid, and there's no scary monster in the father's arms. My soul clings to you. There's me in the garage. Your right hand upholds me. There's God's providence. Let's pray. Father, we are dependent beings. We are finite. We are limited. We need your care. We even need your help in our unbelief. Thank you that you, in your goodness and your greatness, have not just made a beautiful world, but then Pastor us to see how you sustain it and provide for us in it. In barren and fruitful years. In great wealth or in poverty. In sickness and in health. Not just us, but every leaf and blade. May my brothers and sisters, your children, leave here this morning declaring your greatness, even as we're about to sing, and live in a way that even in the midst of all their plans, they know who establishes their steps, and that they would find comfort in their brokenness and submission and sacrifice in their bounty, and they would look like children who are held in the Father's hand. Thank you for your word, which ministers to us in this beautiful way, in this Old Testament text. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.